Morning, guys. Welcome to Coffee Chat. Mm. Wow, I hope you had a great weekend. I know for me, it just went by bang, lickety split. But we did get a lot done. We got all our Christmas decorations out and all that kind of stuff. And that makes Judy very happy. So, of course, that makes me happy. And uh, so that was nice. Boy, it uh, really kind of cooled down this morning as well. Just take a look. See if you can catch the steam coming off my coffee cup there. It is like gotten really a lot colder. Man. Hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, guys, look, I read three articles today that are very big and definitely worth mentioning. Now, the first one is about Bretton Woods, too. Now, if you don't know what Bretton Woods is, so what happened in the 1940s there, just after the Second World War, they held this conference, I think it was in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and that's why they call it Bretton Woods. Needless to say, all these world leaders and delegates got together, and that's where they formed the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank at the same time. Now, from that, they developed a monetary policy that was going to have effects all the way even up until now. So they just got finished with a Bretton Woods II is what they're calling it. And in this Bretton Woods too, the one thing that struck me big time was this. President Xi of China comes out, flat out, and offers all of the Arabian nations to trade oil in the yuan. That is a big deal, guys, and I'll tell you why. It has been since about the 1970s when Henry Kissinger went over there to Saudi Arabia and negotiated a deal that they would not sell any of their oil other than utilizing the U.S. dollar. And that has given the U.S. dollar a major advantage against world currencies and, of course, has made the U.S. dollar um, the world reserve currency in the petrodollar. Well, you can see that this is a absolute front-on, head-on attack against this current monetary dominance that the U.S. dollar has enjoyed. And I think, guys, we are on the verge of watching it literally collapse right before our very eyes. And if it does, I'm going to tell you something. The U.S., a lot of folks don't even realize that a majority of the economic benefits and lifestyle that most Americans enjoy is due to the petrodollar. Absolutely zero doubt. And with that being put under a lot of pressure, man, this thing has caused wars and literally the toppling of governments over, you know, any kind of an attack against the U.S. dollar when it comes to the petrodollar. A known fact, historical fact, fact check it if you need to, but it's true. Needless to say, this has now come out of Bretton Woods and look at what Saudi Arabia recently did with Biden there. They had never done that before, by the way, where they publicly came out and made it absolutely known that they just weren't going to play ball. And so now they're playing ball with President Xi. You should have seen the reception that he got when he went over there versus what Biden got. It is unbelievable. Biden got a pauper's welcome in comparison to what this President Xi just got. Truly amazing. So you can almost see the handwriting on the wall and it might be something to keep your, you know, your thumbs on just to, you know, or keep your fingers on, know the pulse of what's happening. Mm. Because this is going to have a major impact in my belief. Now, another article that I read, and this is kind of a really big deal too, is I apparently, you know, and I've read both sides of this deal. So, you got folks coming out right now saying, hey, look, uh, Binance didn't pass their audit and all this kind of stuff. And oh, their auditor won't back it and on and on and on. And what they're really doing is they're really stretching the narrative way, way further than what it truly is. And of course, they're sowing a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt in there. And Binance has come back and says, are you kidding me? We don't have a dollar of debt. We have our own corporate reserves, not to mention we have reserves one-to-one -one for every Bitcoin that's deposited on their exchange. They've come out and been able to show, hey, look, we've got it. Now, having said that, I don't trust any exchange wholeheartedly, and I always encourage folks, use an exchange for what an exchange is, buying and selling. I don't use an exchange to house or store my digital assets because, look, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We kind of have an idea and we hope things are good, but who would have ever thought FTX would have happened? So that's where it's the whole idea of self-custody comes into play. Look, I use an exchange for what an exchange is when I need one. 
and I normally prefer to go through a broker, by the way. But needless to say, if I need to buy or sell, of course, I'm going to have to do that through an exchange or a broker. But I'm not keeping my crypto there. I'm actually, even with my broker, Caleb and Brown, what I'll do is they'll execute a trade and I just get them to send me my crypto right to my cold storage wallet, which they're more than happy to do. But I hold on to my crypto self-storage and in multiple places, obviously. Hmm. But that's what I think is the best idea is because, hey, in this digital asset space, it's not like you're having a safe full of you know, bars of gold or, you know, you know, stacks of cash that if someone broke in and, you know, whatever. I mean, you have these things at all various locations. Nobody really knows. But, you know, you're able to have your digital assets in these multiple cold storage wallets and have control of them at all times. And look, even if the wallets themselves were stolen, confiscated or destroyed, hey, you got your seed phrase right up here for those wallets, right? And if you have a, and, and, or another method where you can get to it and hey, if they don't have that, they get locked up pretty quick. They don't get access to it either. So I like self custody and that's why I would report that. But the whole deal about this article and on top of that, you know, you have them article coming out saying, oh, well, the Justice Department's looking at dropping charges against Binance and all this and this for money laundering, blah, blah, blah. Guys, what they're doing there is really stretching it because the Justice Department hasn't come out and said anything that they're considering drop. No, what they said is they initiated and requested information in order to do like a formal investigation. Yes, but have they come out and said, oh, we're considering d dropping charges against them? No, they have not. So what people are doing is they're putting a lot of implication. They're implying things there because there's an investigation. There must be a consideration of charging or blah, 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 blah. And this is why you have to dissect the FUD. Because I'll tell you what, in this space and in any market really, the news narrative is absolutely crazy. You will get all kinds of media personalities and all kinds of stuff come on, all offering their personal opinion as though it was gospel truth and fact. And it influences, and it's meant, by the way, they'd say, oh, no, no, it's just opinion. It's meant to influence. Jim Cramer coming out there and crapping all over XRP, saying it's a con, it's a this, it's a that, or whatever. You don't think that guy is just offering his opinion? No, he knows that people are listening, and he is really, really trying to influence the situation. What really blows my mind is this is the same guy that was you know, really promoting it when it was way up here and flat out got clips out there saying it is absolutely irresponsible to not have crypto in your portfolios. And so guys, you can just see how they utilize these articles and the language that they use, the motivation, the intent and all that kind of stuff. Now, is it unethical? Yes. Is it illegal? No, it is not. <laughs> hmm. But that's how they work it, and it's the psychology of the market, and it has worked so perfectly each and every time because, hey, human emotion were very predictable, and they know that most of us, let's remember this, this entire marketplace, especially for crypto, is motivated, and it's in the index is a fear and greed index fear and greed neither one of those emotions are healthy ones to have for anybody you don't make any good decisions in fear whether it's fear of you know uncertainty and doubt or fear of missing out and i'll tell you what who wants to live a totally self-centered life greed is not the best or the only motivator for accumulating wealth i can tell you that right now <laughs> security is probably a better one than greed and next to that, how about philanthropy? I'm telling you, there's a lot more motivators for having the accumulation of wealth. But that is how this market is gauged, a fear and greed index. That tells you a lot it's right there. And of course, that whole deal is manipulated and they get in there and they try to sway the market with all kinds of various news. When it's way up here, man alive, you can't lose. When it's way down here, wow, it, it, you're, you're never going to win it. You know, and on and on and on it goes. So you got to have, just be, have your wits about you and never make your decisions based on emotion. Look, bottom line for me is this, in the digital assets that I've invested in, and I'll say XRP, namely XLM, Algorand, Hedera, Hashgraph, and all those, I look at the utility. And the reality is this, 
these prices could drop, they could go up, they could go up. The utility has just gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. So from my perspective, I am not worried, not even one itsy bitsy bit. And I'll tell you what, I'm willing to have such resolve that if I have to ride it all the way to zero and back, then I'll do it. And look, we have seen some drops in this digital asset space that you think would be beyond the inability to recover. 90 to 97% drops, only to see those same digital assets returns like such powerhouses that it has been unbelievable. Will that happen again? Well, no one knows for sure. But the thing is, that's what risk is all about. And if you're in this space, you're in one of the most volatile markets that there is, right? <laughs> anyway. Mm. So the last article that I read that is really, really concerning. I guess in Australia, they're putting before their federal government a bill considering to make this a law where folks are going to be required to provide 100 points of identification, so basically their passport or their driver's license or something like that, in order to register and use Facebook, Twitter, and any other social media. Now, they're coming out and saying, oh, this is to protect against abuses in those spaces because people want to hide behind the veil of anonymity and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, you could be liable for slander or, you know, if you're threatening someone. Or this. Well, that is just absolute hogwash because you know why? I know for a fact that they have the technology right now to go out there and people that think they're anonymous are not so anonymous. And they have the ability to track, you would not believe how precise they can track folks without having people that have to cough up all of their passport and all their driver's license info and all that kind of stuff. This is not about the whole narrative of, oh, we got to get back at all these guys that are abusing and saying all this stuff on these platforms. No, this is about control, guys. Don't kid yourself. This is about absolute control. Look at the UK. You can literally be arrested and fined or prosecuted, you know, for for calling someone a bad name or getting ticked off in traffic and giving flipping someone the bird or telling them to F off or, you know, and I don't use that language, but I'm, you know, what but what I'm saying is, look, there is a measure of freedom that we're really losing. This is not about, oh, protecting people from, you know, bad, you know, uh, commenters on social media or whatever. No, this is about the attack against liberty and it is a very slippery slope and you have got to be at 100% vigilant and not capitulate to this. Because look, if I can control your opinion, let's say your opinion is different from mine, but I can control your opinion so that you don't have a platform to voice it. How long is it going to be before someone else gets in there and they don't like my opinion, right? And it's the whole kind of thing that happened way back in the Second World War. And there was a, a guy who came out and said, hey, when they came to get thus and such, well, I didn't say anything. And then when they came to get so-and-so, I didn't say anything. Well, when they came to get me, there was no one left to say anything. You see what I'm saying? So we cannot go down this road. And that's where you just got to stand and say, no, even if that guy's opinion is different than mine, I'm fighting for his liberty to express it, right? Hmm. We're not talking about overt hate speech, which they can prosecute already, or that kind of stuff, or threats against a person's personal security or anything like that. But there are folks out there that are literally crying foul just because someone has a different opinion than them, and that is just ridiculous. And that's where this is going. This is about controlling the narrative and the limiting of free speech. I kid you not, you're seeing it. And if you're seeing it in Australia, don't think you're not going to see it in the United States of America or in Canada or in the UK or on and on and on. It is going to be a big, big deal going forward. And for me, I think a lot of times they get into these G7, G20, they talk about all these things and they decide who's going to test the water first. Well, it looks like Australia is going to test the water first on this one. And I sure hope that the people there and the politicians there stand up up and realize, hey, look, we cannot police free speech like this. We cannot do it. We're not talking about hate speech. We're not talking about people threatening other people's physical security and on and on. We're talking about the, the, the control and the narrative and literally to kind of intimidate people from expressing an opinion that may not necessarily fit the broader narrative of what all these politicians would allow and thus and such. But they're doing it, hiding behind the guise 
of, oh, we're out there to protect people from slander and all this. That, that's hogwash because I can tell you right now for a fact, I know because I've just my prior life, I know that they have the ability to trace these things. So don't think they don't, guys. Anyway, <laughs> crazy. And it's not, you know, when I laugh like that, I'm not thinking it's funny. I'm just like, this is just nonsense. And it just, it's just unbelievable. And it's just like, it, it, you can see it. You can just see it. The handwriting's right on the wall and they're doing it right in front of our noses. So, hey, there you go. Well, guys, I sure hope that you have a fantastic rest of your day. We've got a great video planned for you later on, and it's Monday, start of a brand new week. I hope this week is just fabulous for you. And so until later on today, take care.